Welcome to Better Off. I'm your host, Jill Schlesinger. Today on the show, Tim Harford. He's just written a great book, 50 Inventions That Shaped the Modern Economy, some of which may surprise you. It reshaped the world, the air conditioner. Think about these economic powerhouses now in places such as Dubai, Singapore, Shanghai. These big glass skyscrapers completely unfeasible in hot weather unless you have air conditioning. Welcome to the Better Off Podcast. I'm Jill Schlesinger, your host. We're sponsored by Betterment, the largest independent online financial advisor. Now, by now, you realize that I love great storytellers. It just, it, it takes us all to a different place. It's why you're listening to this podcast. It's why I obsessively listen to many other podcasts. So in fact, I heard our guest on someone else's podcast. I don't even remember whose it was. And I immediately sent Mark an email while I was walking the dogs. Hey, let's get this guy on the show. And the guy is Tim Harford. And the book he was talking about when I was listening to the podcast was called Messy, The Power of Disorder to Transform Our Lives. And I just loved him. But I knew his byline. He's the undercover economist. That's where he writes under the uh, Financial Times, his column. And so it's fantastic. He contributes to lots of different places, but he has written a brand new book called 50 Inventions That Shaped the Modern Economy. And I adored it. So I'm so happy that we figured out a way to get Tim live in London. Now, the good news is he is incredibly entertaining. In fact, so entertaining that I kept him on the line for a really long time. And so we're not going to do your extra call. But don't worry. On Tuesday, you can get our bonus call of the week. Don't worry. It'll be there. But when we have a fantastic storyteller like Tim on the line, we don't let him go. So no call after this interview just me and Tim. Here we go. You're listening to Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. Tim Harford, welcome to Better Off. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing very well. Good to be on the show. Oh, fantastic. So we begin our program with a a slightly different way than maybe you might be used to. We like to ask our guests a very specific question. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. I'm nervous, but I'm ready. Good. What is the best money decision that you have made? Uh, It was, it's quite unusual, but it was to work on a little book called The Undercover Economist as a hobby while I was working professionally in an office in London with no publisher, no agent, and no expectation that anybody would ever read it just because I loved it. And accidentally, it turned into a uh, global bestseller. That's a good way of spending time. I mean, the return on that time investment was pretty fantastic, right? Financially, yes, but also psychically, because I I enjoyed my job, but there were frustrations too. And if I was having an argument with my boss or boring meetings or somebody was bullying me at work, I could say to myself, I wrote 500 words last night, so I don't care as I as I journeyed into the office in the morning. So having that side interest, that extra thing that I was passionate about, it was worth it. E- even if it had never been published, it would still have been worth it. But it turns out to have been a very good financial decision as well. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, your most recent book, 50 Inventions That Shaped the Modern Economy, is really terrific. And I want to understand why you needed or felt passionate about this project? Because there are obviously tons of different folks who've said, hey, here's what's important. It's the light bulb. It's the printing press. What's your take on this? And why did you want to write the book? It's actually goes back to The Undercover Economist. I wrote The Undercover Economist because I'd read some wonderful science books, in particular, a book called E equals MC squared. And I wanted to convey that same joy and sense of wonder that you get in great popular science writing in economics. And I had the same experience recently reading really cool technological histories. So you go back to James Burke's Connections, which is a wonderful book, and Mark Levinson's History of the Shipping Container. Stephen Johnson wrote a book, How We Got to Now. And they're just, they describe how objects were invented and how they changed the world. And I thought, 
this is great. I need to do this for economics, for the subject I love, and explain ideas in economics through the medium of all of these different inventions. It's the best way to tell a story that people will engage with and will understand. And you start with a most interesting topic, number one, the plow. And you write, the plow kickstarted civilization in the first place. How did it do so? Well, the plow makes it uh, more effective to grow crops under your control in a particular uh, region. Um, so it, it sets the stage for agriculture rather than hunter-gatherer societies. But the interesting thing about the plow, it's not just that, it's used to farm cereals, grains. And the thing about grains is you harvest them in a predictable way every year. You store them in a barn or some kind of storehouse, and then someone else can come and take them. So that suddenly you have this setup where there's a fight over the surplus. That means people are setting up armies to protect their own grain surplus or to go and steal somebody else's grain surplus. How do you fund those armies? Well, you have a system of taxation. And so you've got this, this whole edifice of modern civilization, complex societies, cities, taxation, bureaucracies, the whole thing, all the good, all the bad. And it's all built on the foundation of the plow. I love that you started that way because it seems like such a simple object. And then you, you know, kind of go right into barbed wire as as another example of something that really did shape the modern economy. So talk a little bit about barbed wire before we get into some of my favorites around the reinventing how we live. Yes. Well, as with the plow, it's not just an invention that solves a problem. Naturally, we think of inventions as though, you know, we've got this problem, someone invents them, and they fix the problem, and that's nice that we have this new thing. It's never that simple. The plow reshaped societies, and so did barbed wire. Abraham Lincoln, in the 1860s, signs the Homesteading Act. He's trying to shift the economic center of gravity in the United States to the Midwest, away from the South. So anybody who shows up in the Midwest, man, woman, freed slave... If they farm the land and work to improve the land, then that land becomes theirs by right. The government will grant them a title to the land. But that legal title isn't worth anything unless you can protect the land from you know, roaming cattle. And there's not enough wood in the, the great American prairies to build fencing. So suddenly you have this urgent need for fencing materials. And there's this buzz of innovative activity in the Midwest. People know this is a problem. People are trying to solve the problem. And a few years later, a man called J.F. Glidden of DeKalb, Illinois, comes up with recognizably modern barbed wire. And it solves this huge problem for the settlers. But of course, it creates a terrible problem, both for the Native Americans and for the old time cowboys. So as with many of these inventions, they create winners, but they also create losers. In the winners and losers category, I just want to note that you put Google search in there, and I want to get to that in a second. And also later in the book, you have the iPhone, but you don't have, say, the personal computer. Now, what's the distinguishing feature of Google search or the iPhone that, say, a personal computer that, you know, you didn't say, OK, Microsoft Word or whatever you decided. But what was what made those two things get in, but omitting a personal computer or even software associated with it? Yeah, it's a, it's a fair question. So it's worth clarifying what the project is. It's not these are the most important 50 things that I could think of, because that would be quite a predictable list. Instead, what I wanted to do was to tell 50 great stories and to hopefully teach lessons with each story. So some of these essays, they're, they're almost some of these chapters, they're almost like um, like parables. You're learning something about, say, how a technology can reshape the income distribution. Or you're learning something about the importance of global supply chains. Some, sometimes the, the points are very silly and, and, and fun. So with the iPhone, the point I wanted to make was that a lot of the underlying technology is government-funded military technology. Siri was a, a, a originally a military application. So with each case, is there an interesting lesson to, to convey? Is there an interesting story to tell? Is there a surprise? So yeah, the steam engine's not there. The car isn't there. The personal computer isn't there. It's not because they're not important. Uh, it's because I, there were more intriguing stories to tell. I love the story about the elevator because I have a slight fear of elevators. 
And someone just told me a funny story about the using the elevator as a way to think about driverless cars, right? And they said, well, you know, when we had elevators in the beginning, it was a really weird concept. And there was an elevator man working it and would use this control. And then when it was the automatic elevator, they still kept the elevator man in there as the illusion that somebody knew how to actually drive this thing up and down and that that made people feel better. So this scientist basically said to me, we kind of want to do the same thing with driverless cars. We want people people to know that they're really safe, but we have to give them something to show them that they're really safe and they're not sure what that would be. So I want you to talk a little bit about the elevator and why that's in the book. It's an interesting question. And, and funny enough, if I can drop names for a moment, Please. I recently in- interviewed uh, Gary Gas- Kasparov, Gary Kasparov, the great chess player, famous for battling Deep Blue, uh, the, the chess supercomputer. And he was talking about automation he said uh, one of the things that triggered automatic elevators after decades they had the technology for decades there was an elevator strike so the elevator operators went on strike in new york city in protest at something or other which of course is a crisis because you're trying to get to the, the 70th floor of the empire state building with no elevators and so that was the that was a tipping point in persuading people that maybe they could push their own elevator buttons reason one of the reasons i love the elevator is because it's one of these everyday inventions and really the invention is the elevator brake by the way we've had elevators for centuries but no one would get in them until you had a a brake invented that makes them safe so the reason i've got the elevator in there is it's one of these inventions that we just take for granted nobody thinks about it apart from a few people like yourself who are a little nervous and you shouldn't be nervous because they're incredibly safe but we take them for granted and we don't recognize what an amazing feat of engineering they are and what a useful technology they are so the way to think about this if you take a big building take the take the empire state building or take the um the sears tower in chicago now now the willis tower you imagine slicing that building into single stories or double story buildings and distributing those in parking lots all over New Jersey. And and think about the amount of driving that you'd have to take to get between these different buildings and how much parking would be devoted to the automobiles in those parking lots. And all of that is saved because you can stack them all up in this huge tall tower, connect them via elevators, which are super efficient, by the way, because they work with a counterweight. And then, of course, you have the subway coming in underneath. And I mean, it's a tremendously environmentally efficient uh, way of uh, of housing people and of providing office space for people. And I mean, it's not as though people living in New York are thinking, well, this is a frugal environmental community. I mean, it's <laughs> it's one of the richest places on earth, but it's also very environmentally friendly. And it is largely because of the elevator. I love the idea of this because at first I read it, I'm like, well, what about the subway? But then I really did think about the number of people across the world who use elevators versus people in a big city like in London or New York who are much more dependent on mass transit. But it is a miracle sometimes, these things that just get us around as much as we complain about them or the elevator or any of these pieces of, of frankly, innovation and invention that have really impacted our lives. Now, you do have on the cover of this book, which my girlfriend pointed out and she squealed and said, you're going to want to read this book because she saw the cover. And the image on the bottom right is an air conditioner. And I've been known to run around the world saying the air conditioner is probably the best invention of the 20th century. And now I have you to back me up on it. Tell me. It, it, it reshaped the world, the air conditioner. So this was originally developed for the purposes of controlling humidity in color printing shops. So you, you have to put the paper through the printing press several times with different colored inks and if the paper because of the humidity grew or shrank even a fraction of an inch it would just look terrible so you had to control the humidity and that's why the air conditioner was originally developed and then pretty quickly people realize hmm it's a lot more comfortable in the room where the printing presses are and so you you start to have things like the summer blockbuster and the movies the shopping mall. Originally, they take off because this is a place where you can go where it's oppressively hot and humid outside, but you can go indoors and air conditioning is provided. Of course, now we have air conditioning in our homes if you live in that particular part of the world. And I mean, there's a wonderful piece by the writer Stephen Johnson on, on the air conditioner. Who He says that um, the air conditioner elected Ronald Reagan. It shifted the center of gravity back towards the south. 
you know, states like Florida and Texas. As more and more older people filled these states, they became uh, Republican voters. They wouldn't have been there if it hadn't been for the development of air conditioning. I would take that a step further and think, reflect on the global trends as well. You think about these economic powerhouses now in places such as Dubai, Singapore, Shanghai, huge skyscrapers. These big glass skyscrapers, completely unfeasible in hot weather unless you have air conditioning. Tim, should I feel guilty that I am poisoning the world because of my love of air conditioning? Well, we all need to take steps on that because all, all of these wonderful inventions, well, many of these wonderful inventions that I describe in the book consume energy. And most of the energy at the moment that we uh, produce comes from fossil fuels and that emits carbon dioxide. And you know, that's contributing to global warming. And of course, the air conditioners themselves, their exhausts are warm. So that warms the cities that they're located in so that intensifies the effect so you know we we need to do something but often technological progress can help the great thing about the air conditioner it's mostly used in very hot sunny places so that does at least open up the potential for using solar power to run some of these units we don't have the same thing here, here in the uk where where i live peak electricity demand is five o'clock in the evening in December. And I can assure you, and I'm sure you know this from your own experience living in London, there's not a lot of sunshine at five o'clock on a December evening <laughs> in the UK. We're quite far north. So you know, there's always hope, but we can't take these environmental problems for granted and just assume they'll solve themselves because they won't. Okay, I want to go into inventing the wheel because what you don't probably know is that I am one of the biggest fangirls for index funds. And so I was delighted to see that number 45 on the 50 inventions that shaped the modern economy was none other than the simple and beautiful index fund. Can you please explain why it's included in the book? Yes. I mean, because I am an economist, there are various inventions that more technologically minded people might have omitted. So, I, I, for example, I discuss the, the invention of paper money and the invention of insurance. But the index fund is one of my favorites. I'm a big fan of index funds as well. One of the reasons why I love this is because it's an example of, a, a rare example, of an academic idea leaping out of the pages of the textbooks, the, the, the peer-reviewed journals, and taking shape in real markets. There's a technical term for this, by the way, it's called performativity, where economists are studying markets and then suddenly the markets themselves are changed because the economists are studying it. And the index fund is, I think, one of the most benign examples. Paul Samuelson, Nobel Memorial Prize winner, advisor to John F. Kennedy, one of the most influential economists of the 20th century, issued a challenge to fund managers. He said, most of you guys should quit. You can't beat the market. Oh, and by the way, somebody should start a fund that just tracks the market because it doesn't exist. I mean, this is as recently as the mid-1970s. It's not that long ago. No index funds. And a gentleman called John Bogle, most famous for his fund Vanguard uh, and his organization Vanguard, he reads Samuelson's work. He's been thinking along those lines himself. And he says, okay, I will. I will set up an index fund. And of course, he's just laughed out of Wall Street. People just think the whole idea is ridiculous. Slowly but surely, index funds have caught on. Uh, they've proved to be very effective. And a few years ago, shortly before he died, Samuelson actually gives this speech where he praises Vanguard and he praises the index fund. And he says it's one of the great inventions. It's like wine and cheese and the wheel and, and the alphabet. So, you know, he, he was fond of it, perhaps understandably, but I'm fond of it too. This is Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. Wine, cheese, the alphabet, and the index fund. Oh my gosh, is that fantastic? We'll get back to our interview with author Tim Harford in just a minute. But I love the idea that there are inventions that substantially change and improve our lives. That's the beauty of it. And that's what index funds really did decades ago. Perhaps the next iteration of the index fund is the independent online financial advisor. And that is why I am so delighted that Betterment is the sponsor of this show. This is a service that is designed to help improve customers' long-term returns and lower taxes for retirement planning, building wealth, any other financial goal. 
Betterman takes advanced investment strategies and uses technology to deliver those strategies to you. All of that with low transparent advisory fees, a quarter of a percent of assets under management. All of this, it's just amazing to me, is a way to really give every single investor access to one of these simple but elegant solutions. Better off listeners, you can get up to six months managed free. For more information, visit betterment.com slash better off. Betterment, rethink what your money can do. And now back to my interview with Tim Harford. Okay, I have one invention for your sequel that I want you to consider. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'm all ears. Now, don't go crazy here because I'm going to put my my gender out there. What about the idea of the tampon? Here's why. Stay with me. No, we we have we have considered it, but I want to hear your uh, so, your discussion. Yeah. So my thought process was, without the tampon, women could not have been part of the workforce. But now there's this solution. So I think it it essentially helps women get into the workforce. What do you think, Tim? You can use it. Just just cite me. Just give me a little hat tip on Twitter. I, I'll I'll give you the hat tip for sure. I mean, we we did consider it, and actually one of the reasons why I didn't put it in the original book was because I couldn't find good research on it. And, you know, and obviously I don't want to just make it up as I go along. And I'm no great expert on the the history of women's rights. So we did have in the book, the contraceptive pill. We had the TV dinner uh, in favor of the washing machine. The story people tell about the washing machine liberating women isn't true of the washing machine, but it is true of the TV dinner and, and processed food. And we also have infant formula milk. And funny enough, the department store, the, the presence of uh, women's lavatories in department stores turned out to be important. So, I mean, I I was alive to the issue, but when I looked, I couldn't find good research. I couldn't find a good account of this. What you say makes sense, but I couldn't actually stand it up. So if I do a sequel, I'm just going to have to do more reading, do more research, work harder, and see if I can come up with something. Or we're going to have to commission a study. That's really what we're going to have to look at. Yeah, there's a literature on everything. There must be a study, but I'm afraid I couldn't find it. All right, we're going to find it for you. Um, okay, uh, I also want to mention, so everyone should go out right now and get 50 inventions that shape the modern economy. But also, concurrently, because you're not busy enough, you've got uh, the your book, Messy, last year's book, is out in paperback. And, yeah. and that's... Beginning of October. Over, yeah. I love this book. So let me just tell you, everybody, that I read this book because someone gave it to me and said, you are so obsessive about your email inbox. You need to read this book, Messy, by Tim Harford. And uh, the subtitle is The Power of Disorder to Transform Our Lives. I love the the premise, which is essentially... You know what? Um, you want this to. You want to be all tidy, and in fact, uh, some messiness is good. You begin the book with a story about uh, Keith Jarrett, which I would love for you to recount. It is an astonishing story. So, the, so the story begins uh, late January 1975. This young German girl, she's 17 years old, Vera Brandes. She has managed to get herself somehow in the position where she is the youngest concert promoter in Germany Uh, because she loves jazz. She just wants more jazz. So she has persuaded at this tender age the Cologne Opera House, which is a huge venue, to host this late night concert by the American jazz pianist Keith Jarrett. And he's going to show up. He's going to sit down at this piano and he will just start improvising. Um, No sheet music, nothing. It is a sellout. 1,400 people are going to watch this concert, which is big even by Keith Jarrett's standards. He's never played solo. He's played with people like Miles Davis, but he's never played solo in front of such a big crowd. And when Vera Brandes brings him on stage to introduce him to the piano just a few hours before this concert, he takes one look at it and, and immediately he knows there's a problem. He plays a few keys and he comes over to Vera Brandes and he says, I'm not playing. I am not playing. If you can't get a new piano, I can't play. And there'd been a mix-up at the Opera House. They had brought up a rehearsal model. It's out of tune, the pedals are sticking, felt is worn away, so it sounds harsh and tinny. And it's, it's too small. It's not even loud enough to fill the arena. But it is 1970s Germany, late on a Friday afternoon. Everyone's gone home. There is no way to get a new piano. And so Vera manages to find a piano tuner and it it knocks it into some kind of shape, but it's still a terrible, terrible old instrument. And Keith doesn't want to play, but he realizes that when these people come, these 1,400 people are going to show up, they're going to tear this girl apart. 
if he doesn't play. He just takes pity on her and agrees to play. And when he, later that night, walks onto the stage, when he sits down at this unplayable piano and begins, he is not prepared for what's about to happen. Nobody is prepared for what's about to happen. It's a masterpiece. It is absolutely a masterpiece. And it became a best-selling album. It was recorded because... Keith Jarrett wanted documentary evidence of what a terrible, terrible concert sounds like. <laughs> but he, he didn't get this terrible concert. He got this masterpiece because all of the adjustments he had to make while he was playing the piano, avoiding the upper registers, well, that puts you in the middle of the keyboard. It's soothing and ambient, but you're having to hit the keys really hard because the piano's so quiet. So there's this dynamism about the way he's playing it, but he's also playing this very, very soothing tones. It just makes the whole thing electrifying. And so that's the beginning of the book and the discussion of why when when we're knocked off course, when we have to work with difficult people, when we have obstacles or distractions in our way, why so often does that actually raise our game? Because it is by no means unique to Keith Jarrett. I mean, he's a great talent, but the same thing, basically the same story could be told about commuters on the London Underground. There was a London Underground strike a few years ago. A lot of commuters had to rejig their commute. Some of the tube trains were closed, some weren't, some of the stations were closed, some were open, but people could still travel on the buses and so on. And so commuters just adjusted. 48 hours later, the strike's over. And we've got really good data on this. Tens of thousands of people never went back. So the strike made them realise they'd been getting it wrong their whole lives. They had been commuting to work wrong for decades. So this interruption of randomness and disorder very often sparks a problem-solving res response. And that's partly what Messy is all about. And I also love the uh, chapter about improvisation because, uh, you know, many people will say to me, like, oh, you're on the radio or you're on your podcast or you're on TV and you improvise. And I think of something that is in the book, which is, you're saying that careful preparation is essential, but you, and I'm quoting, there are also times when it makes sense to embrace the messy process of improvisation. I just thought of it because this week, because I was doing a TV segment and it was about Toys R Us going bankrupt, declaring bankruptcy. And in the middle of the segment, one of the anchors asks me about a completely different topic. I mean, really, a totally different topic, uh, the Equifax data breach. And the response that I gave him of all the times I've talked about Equifax, probably, you know, 80 times in the last week, it was the most concise answer I have ever had to a question about the data breach. I did it in 25 seconds, three specific points. I knew the information, but I'd never said it in such a succinct way. And it only happened because it was improvised. I had no choice. It was live TV. Yeah, and, and if only we could bottle that, right? Except we, we can't bottle it, but we keep trying to bottle it. So we, we script all these interactions. Sometimes there's a good reason for that, but very often that more human improvised response works incredibly well. I mean, if you're a jazz musician like Keith Jarrett, you can do it with an instrument, but we're all very practiced at talking. We all get practice at talking and listening and talking and listening every day. And so we need to tap into that a, a little more. It's partly because you're able to respond to what's in front of you, to the context. You're listening to somebody and you're responding to exactly what they've said. And that's got a tremendous power. But there's also a, just a very strange creative process that goes on in the brain. I describe some of the neuroscientific research into improvisation that seems to disinhibit us a little bit and the creativity flows out. And there's a, there's a story I tell at the end of that chapter about two of Martin Luther King's greatest speeches – both of which were improvised. And a lot of people know the I Have a Dream speech. What they don't know is the first half of that speech was carefully scripted. And the Reverend Dr. King was a poet. He was a great writer. Mm -hmm. But when you read the text, nobody remembers anything of that. It was, a, you know, uh, our forefathers cashed a promissory note and we are here to redeem the debt. It's just that no one remembers any of it. I have a dream that one day those words, they were improvised in the moment because he realized that what he was saying wasn't hitting home. It wasn't striking a chord. And so he just began to improvise. And that was the power of the speech. And that is the moment that everybody remembers. It's an amazing story. I can't let you go without asking why I should not be completely obsessive about my inbox, which I am. 
Okay, I don't want to tell you how to run your inbox, but I will tell you what the research says. Okay. So there's a great study by a psychologist called Steve Whitaker. So Steve Whitaker writes that the title of this study is, Am I Wasting My Time Organizing Email? And the answer is, yes, you are. <gasps> because it turns out, and there are a couple of exceptions, I'll talk about them in a second if you like, but basically it turns out if you just search for email using the search function that is in any modern email software is available you will find your email just as quickly as if you look for it in this very complex set of folders that you have set up and the reason it doesn't feel like that is because folders are visual and we feel very comfortable with visual metaphors Mm. whereas the search is text but actually it's just as effective and of course you save all that time that you would you know you were setting up folders and dragging and dropping and Whitaker talks more generally about filing not just uh, email filing but electronic documents and physical documents and he says very often we suffer from the problem of premature filing (laughs) so this thing is a great phrase isn't it premature filing so this thing comes onto your desk comes into your inbox and if you're a tidy-minded person you want to get you want to get it out of the inbox, off your desk. You want to put it somewhere where it belongs. But you don't know where it belongs because you don't have a context. You don't quite understand, is this going to be super important? Is this going to be the first email in this long, um, is this huge project? Or is it just going to be something that will be forgotten by uh, two o'clock this afternoon? You, You don't know. And so if you try to file it too quickly, what tends to happen is, you know, it will go into a folder and then there'll, there'll be only ever be one email in that folder and you will have no idea where it was. Um, whereas if it stays in your inbox or alternatively, if you just quickly type out a response and archive it, uh, yeah, you probably never need to, to search for it again. But if you do need to search for it again, you'll find it. So that is the way I now try and deal with my, uh, my email. I should say there is a, an exception to the rule. If there's a very clear structure to the email already then it can help to put it in a folder. So if you're working in accountancy or tax preparation right. and all the documents that come in, you, you know exactly where they belong, fine, have a folder, put them in the folder. That, there's nothing wrong with that. But very often it, it's much more generic. So for me, if I have a particular event, I'm going to speak at a book festival, I'll set up a folder for that event. Right. And, and I'll drag everything into that folder and then when the festival's done, I can just archive the whole folder. But in most cases... I'm just, you know, just reply, archive, reply, archive. Uh, I'm quite happy to get to nothing in my inbox. But what I don't want is this huge collection, this forest of folders, because it's not actually helping. So I have a little method that I developed a million years ago, and I call it the four D's. Mm -hmm. So that the when when I have an email, so it was do now, like I actually have to respond to this. This is breaking news. Someone wants me on the radio. Do now. Next one is delay, where basically I don't do anything. Delegate. Hey, I'm sending it to Mark, the producer, who's going to make sure that we get connected with Tim Harford. Or dump it. I am an obsessive dumper of emails. Like, I I literally just delete as much as possible. And I think that I have to get more comfortable just saying, like, I don't have to do that all the time. Because that's a waste of time in and of itself. Well, I don't know. I'm I'm actually, I'm with you. I'm quite happy with the deleting. Just throw the stuff in the trash. What I'm against is the excessive attempts to organize it. Okay. So so what what you're describing sounds to me perfectly fine. It's it's funny because people contrast my book, Messy, with um, the famous Marie Kondo book, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up. Right. Oh, you guys are like, you're like opposites. We're not opposites at all. I think Marie Kondo's right about loads of things. But the thing is, she says very early on in that book, if you want to tidy up, forget organizational systems. You know, forget filing cabinets, forget, you know, sort of uh, vast uh, closets and wardrobes. And that doesn't work. The only thing that works is to just have less stuff. That works within, with your inbox as well. Like if you're willing to delegate it or dump it, fine, no problem, no problem at all. It's when you create these very elaborate structures, file everything in these elaborate structures, and then tell yourself, that you've done something. You haven't done anything. You've just concealed the problem underneath an organizational system that won't work. So I think you and I, we're, we're on the same wavelength here, and maybe Marie Kondo as well. Okay, excellent. Uh, Tim Harford, before we let you leave, we started the program by asking your best money move, and you said that was writing the undercover economist sort of on the sly in your spare time. You're ready for the bookend. What's the worst money move that you've made? Uh, well... I I am fortunate that I have not had too many catastrophic events yet, but I would say the worst money move I made, 
I was prevented from actually taking the step. So when we moved out of London, I now live in Oxford, which is about an hour away. I said, we have to sell our house because the London property market is going to collapse. I've looked at the, you know, I looked at the economics and the London property market is definitely going to collapse. It's, it's a bubble. And my wife said, well, I'm sure you're right, Tim. You're the economist. But two of our children were born in that house and we held our wedding reception in that house. And I built that house and my brother lives next door to that house and I'm not going to sell that house. So you may be right about the economics, but I'm holding on to the house. Of course, financially, it turns out to have been a fantastic decision to have held on to the house. I was completely wrong. But thankfully, the emotion overwhelmed the financial reasoning. And now I think of it, it's interesting because both the first question and the last question you asked me, what really governed the decision was the emotional justification, not the financial justification. And the financial consequences just you know, came and went, the, you know, just, that's just fate. Tim Harford, thank you so much for joining us. Everyone should go out and buy these two books right now, 50 Inventions That Shape the Modern Economy, as well as Messy, The Power of Disorder to Transform Our Lives. Go, click, do whatever you need to do. Read Tim Harford. He's also the author of The Undercover Economist, and I know him as the senior columnist at the Financial Times. And he hosts lots of radio. And uh, when I come back to London, then I'll just come visit you in Oxford because I love Oxford. There's some fabulous pubs there. I look forward to seeing you there. That's great. Thanks to Tim Hartford, author of 50 Inventions That Shaped the Modern Economy. Go out and get that book. And while you're at it, buy his other book, Messy, The Power of Disorder to Transform Our Lives. It's out in paperback. Don't forget, we've got our bonus episode that comes out on Tuesdays and the longer form every single Thursday. You can subscribe via iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have any questions or suggestions, you can find me on Twitter. My handle is at Jill on Money. That's at Jill on Money. Just use the hashtag better off. You can also reach me via email. Ask Jill at better off dot com. That's ask Jill at better off dot com. And if you wouldn't mind, please leave us a review or a rating in iTunes. It really will help us out. Better Off is sponsored by Betterment. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Delercio produces. I'm Jill Schlesinger. See you next week.